You are welcome to Div Tutor Academy, where we are devoted to building academic excellence in students in the STEM subject. Now, this video is going to be the detailed solution to one of the past questions on physics. And so we are tagging it the physics exam prep. Now, if you are preparing for any of your O level exams, talk about WAHEC, NECO, GCE, even GED, GCSE, this video is going to be quite useful for you. And some of the topics that are featured is being shown on the board there. We are going to be talking about equations of motion. We are going to be talking about astrophysics. We are going to be talking about optics. And all of these, they are going to be well solved, well explained, so that you can go ahead and actually develop academic excellence in your endeavors. Now, if you are yet to subscribe to our channel, we are putting up a lot of resources that are constantly being updated so that we can prepare you for academic excellence. So, our advice is that go ahead, subscribe to the channel. If you find any video useful, like it so that you can easily refer to it for subsequent times. PDF workbooks will also be uploaded into this, our video, so you can also check them out. Maybe after watching the video, you also want to revise with them because our aim is that we want you to gain that academic excellence. And with that, let's head over to our video. We are being asked that a graph of tensile stress is plotted against tensile strain. And what does the slope of the graph represent? If you are to draw that graph out, we are being told that it is um, tensile stress against tensile strain. So now, normally the graph will be a straight line graph. And for us, we are being asked that what is the slope of this graph of stress versus strain? Now, this is a depiction of our slope. So you can see this is our slope. And by reason of our understanding of mathematics, slope is the change in the y axis over change in the s axis. And if you are representing that correctly, our y axis is um, the stress, and then the s axis is the strain. So we're having this slope to be stress over strain. And stress over strain is nothing but the Young's modulus. So the graph of tensile stress plotted against tensile strain will give a slope that is the Young's modulus. So that's that with that question. Now in this question number B, we're asked to state the energy transformation in shooting a piece of stone using a catapult. Okay, so if you have our catapult here and we have the sling attached to it, normally for us to actually use a catapult, we draw out, we draw back the sling, okay? And maybe we have a stone there that we want to actually launch for to shoot at a bed, shoot at a lizard, whatever it is we use that for. Now, normally we draw the string back. And then after drawing the string back, what we do is we release, we draw it back like this. And then after release, the stone will fly forward. Now, the energy transformation taking place is the potential energy that is being stored in the string is being released to give the kinetic energy of the stone. So the energy transformation is potential energy to kinetic energy. And that is the solution to our question here. In this question, we are told that an archer pulls a bow by 0 0.7 meters with an arrow of mass 60 grams. The stiffness of the bow is given as 200 newton per meter, and we are to calculate the speed of the arrow immediately after its release. So if you have the diagram of our bow as being shown in the diagram, so we want to look at the case scenario before the bow is being pulled. And we are told that before it is pulled, even just normally, the bow has a stiffness of 200 newton per meter. So if you are to look at the bow in its resting position, before the string is pulled, let's show the string like this. Okay? So this is how the bow is. But then, at the point of shooting an arrow, the bow, the, the string of the bow is going to be pulled backward, as being shown now in the red ink. So we are pulling the string of the bow backward. So we have an arrow that is about to be shot at something. Okay? It's shot at a target. So now we are told that the extension by which the bow was pulled, um, that was given as 0 0.7 meters. So you can say we want to represent that. So this extension from the initial position before being pulled, and now that it's being pulled, 
the extension is 0 0.7 meters. All right. So the mass of the arrow was given as 60 grams. So mass is 60 grams. Now um, we can convert that to kilogram by dividing by 1,000. So the mass will be 0 .0, uh, be 0 0.06 kilogram. Now the property of the bow, we are given the stiffness, the stiffness K. The stiffness of the bow K is 200 newtons per meter. Okay. So we are asked to find the speed of the arrow immediately after its release. Now with the understanding of the conversion of energy from here in this case potential energy to kinetic energy we can actually state out what we are being asked we are being asked what is the velocity okay we know the stiffness of the boat to be 200 newtons per meter we know the um we know the extension of the bow to be 0 0.7 meters now we know the mass of the arrow to be 0 0.06 kilogram but what is happening here is actually a translation of energy from potential energy when the bow is being pulled to kinetic energy when the bow is released and the arrow is shot at a specific target. So the principle of conservation of energy is telling us that the elastic potential energy of the bow is equal to the kinetic energy of the arrow. So if you want to just equate that and put in our equation, what is the formula for the elastic potential energy of the bow? In this particular case, it is 1 over 2 multiplied by the stiffness multiplied by the extension raised to power 2. Then the kinetic energy of the arrow is um, half multiplied by the mass of the arrow multiplied by the square of the velocity. We can cut out the half and then substitute for the values of all the values we are having here. K is 200 newton per meter. Extension is 0 0.7 meters. Okay. The mass of the bow is of the arrow is 0 0.06 kilogram. Then we are looking for the velocity of the arrow. Now we can divide both sides by 0 0.06. And if you bring in a calculator to solve for the left hand side, we will have that to be 200 multiplied by 0 0.7 raised to power 2 divided by 0 0.06. So that is. 1633.3. Okay, so V raised to power 2 is 1633.33.3, such that the velocity will now be the square root of 1633.3. So if we just want to find the square of our answer, square root of our answer, that will be 40.4 meters per second square. So 40.4 meters per seconds. That would be 40.4 meters per seconds. And that is the solution to our problem. In this question, we are asked to state three advantages of optical fibers over conductors. Okay, now for those of us that don't know what these are, it is just as shown. And because we are talking about optical fibers in comparison with conductors, I think we should be talking about our um, networking scenarios. And now a scenario is being depicted on the diagram. Now a router may be connected to the internet through some um, so many various means. Talk about lease line, um, fiber optics also, whatever it is. But now particularly I want to be concerned about the internal connection of the active devices in say an enterprise. Now we can have a router, we can have an um, aggregation switch or a core switch. We can have um, an access switch as being just shown, okay? And then we can have our end devices. Talk about um, laptops, PCs, servers. Sometimes we also include um, some wireless devices. So, but for this scenario, let's talk about, say, a laptop, then a PC, a PC with a monitor and a desktop machine, okay? And then this is a PC. Now also have, let's say, a server where we're actually storing some devices for retriever and co. Now, if you are looking at this type of scenario, a typical means of connecting all these devices is if the devices are supporting, um, let's say they are supporting fiber optics, the router can connect to the core switch with a fiber optic cable, okay? Then the switch, the core switch and the access switch can also be connected through 
fiberoptic cables as shown in red. But now, end devices um, can be connecting to the access switches by CAT6 conductors as shown in blue. So, blue for CAT6 and red for fiber optics. So, what are the advantages of optical fibers over conductors? The very first one we are looking at here is that um, the optical fibers operate at faster speed because it's called uses light to transmit data and can do this for up to 10 gig gigabit per second and sometimes even 40 gigabits per second depending on the support of the device on which it's being plugged into. Now, because it's optical fiber, it can also cover long distances. So it's used in submarine cables and typically maybe for the general use, you can use Whenever you are using multi-mode fiber optic cable, it can cover 550 meters, but for single mode, it can cover five kilometers. Now, CAT6 conductors, conductors generally, they only cover a maximum of 100 meters. Now, um, optical fibers are also more reliable as they are not susceptible to EMI. EMI is the interference that comes as a result of um, electro electricity trying to also um, affect the conduction of the transmission of data in the CAT6 conductors. And then even though initially when you want to set up your fiber optic cables, then they tend to be more costly. But in the long run, the total cost of ownership when using optical fibers is far more lower compared to using CAT6 conductors. So these are some of the advantages of optical fibers over conductors. Here in this question, we're asked to state one use of geostationary satellites and polar orbit satellites. Now, um, geostationary satellites are generally regarded as satellites that are fixed over a particular equator of the Earth. So if you have the heart, and then we have a particular satellite that is not moving around the heart, it's just fixed at a particular location. That's what is called the geostationary satellite. Now, because of the fact that this satellite is fixed, is quite useful for um, monitoring, is used for broadcasting. So all, all, the, all the communication devices, whenever you want to talk about that, you are talking about the geostationary satellite, okay? So these are some of the uses of um, geostationary satellite. It's fixed at about 36 kilometers above um, the surface of the heart. Now, when we're talking about the polar orbit satellite, you know, looking at the world, it's saying that there's an orbit that this satellite is actually traversing through. So this satellite is moving around the heart with a period of 24 hours. So in a day, it would have circumvented its way across the globe. And of course, looking at that, one of the very good uses for which they use this is for espionage, for spying, you want to know, okay, what is happening in this particular location? After I'm coming back the second time, is it still the same thing that I'm observing, okay? It's also used for art mapping. It's also used for so many other uses. Well, we have to stay just one use. So I, I believe that this will suffice in this particular question. In this question, we're asked to list the forces that keep the heart revolving around the sun. Okay, so um, the heart revolves around the sun. And if you are looking at the heart, why is it that the heart is not... Um, varying of its course of navigation around the sun. This is largely to, this is largely due to two particular forces: the centrifugal force and the centripetal force. Now, if you are looking at the axis of the heart to the sun, normally the heart is moving with a particular velocity around the sun, but the centripetal force is directed towards the sun, and then the gravitational force is directed outside. Um, the sun, okay, just as shown in the diagram, and then the velocity of the heart is just, so it's just um, moving along as if it wants to veer off, but because of the of these forces, it is being kept in the orbit so that it is revolving around the sun. So these are the centripetal force and the centrifugal force. Now, in this second question, we are told that a force is applied to an object of mass M such that in time t, the velocity changes by changing v in the direction of f to m. We are to write an equation relating f to m, delta v, and t. Now, generally, what is the formula for m, the force? In this question, we are giving f, we are giving m, and we are giving change in v in time t. So if you are to recall, we know that the force 
is generally given as mass times acceleration, okay? But now we are not given the acceleration outrightly, but we know that the acceleration is um, changing velocity over t, that is a um, final velocity minus in initial velocity over t. So for this particular case, we are not giving initial and final velocity. So we should stick with change in velocity over t. So if we are to substitute that, we can say f is m delta v over t, and that is the expression for the force. This question is asking us the dangers associated with the use of a laser. Now, a laser is a device that shoots a monochromatic light of high intensity, which can be dangerous if it's not handled properly. So some of the dangers included with the use of laser include explosion, we can have a fire outbreak, it can burn the skin. Now, if it is exposed directly to the eye, it can also cause eye damage. So whenever we handle the laser, we should actually be careful. In this second question, we are told that a laser produces a beam of light of frequency 4.82 exponent 14 hertz. We are to calculate the energy of a photon in the laser beam. We are given the Planck's constant h to be 6.6 multiplied by 10 raised power minus 4 joule seconds. Now, what we need to know before we can do this is what is the formula for the energy of a photon of light. Now, the formula E is given as FH. Now, it's interesting that in this, in this particular question, we're just giving the frequency. We're not talking about the wavelength. We're not talking about the speed of light. So, it's making our work easy, okay? The energy of the photon in the laser beam is given as the frequency multiplied by the Planck's constant. So, if you are to put in the values, that will be 4.8 to exponent 14 multiplied by 6.6 .6 exponent minus 34. So, let's bring in our calculator to solve that. So, for... 4.82 exponent 14 multiplied by 6.6 .6 exponent minus 34. So that will be 3.18 exponent minus 19 as 3.18 exponent minus 19 joules. Okay, so that is the answer to our question here. In this question, we are told that an artificial satellite is placed in a geostationary orbit at a height of 9.6 exponent 6 meters above the surface of the heart. And we are to calculate the speed of the satellite in the orbit. We are given the radius of the heart to be 6.4 exponent 6 meters and pi to be 3.14. Now, if you are to depict this diagram pictorially, let's look at the diagram of the heart. Africa is mentioned in black. Then we have the body, body of water. Let's show that in blue, just some light blue. Okay. Now, this is the heart. We are talking about a satellite that is placed 9 or 6 exponent 6 meters above the surface of the heart. So, let's say this is our satellite has been shown. So, from the distance of the satellite, from the location of the satellite to the surface of the heart, we have this to be 9.6 exponent 6 meters. So let's call that h. Let's say this is the distance h to be 9.6 exponent 6 meters. Okay. Now in the question, we are given that the radius of the heart from the surface of the heart to the heart core. Okay. We are given the radius of the heart to be. The radius R, at radius capital R, was given as 6.4 exponent 6 meters. Now, what we need to note, if you are asked to find the speed, we know that this particular satellite is going through a geostationary orbit. So if we try to depict that, we can say the satellite is navigating its way across the path that is being shown in blue. So it will be revolving around the heart. Okay. Now, the time for it to complete a revolution there is going to be 24 hours because it will make a complete revolution in one day. And one day is 24 hours. Now, we are looking at the distance covered. We are seeing that this orbit 
is having a radius of our small r giving us the radius of the heart plus the height of the satellite. So the radius of its revolution to the center of the heart will now be, um, if you had 9.6 and 6.4, that would be 16 exponent 6 meters. So we know the orbit when we are asked to find the speed of the satellite. From our understanding of physics, speed is giving us distance over time. Now, for this particular case, we are noticing that our distance is actually the circumference of the circle, okay? Circumference of the circle that's been denoted as the orbit of the satellite. So we have the circumference of orbit, and the formula for the circumference is nothing but 2 pi r. And our r has been gotten to be the sum of the radius of the Earth and the height of the satellite to the surface of the Earth. Now, the time is 24 hours. That's the period it will take to complete one revolution. And if we convert that to seconds, that will be 24 multiplied by 60 multiplied by 60 again. That's the conversion to seconds. So, uh, the speed of the satellite will be the distance. That's 2 times 3.14. Then multiply by the radius. That's 16 exponent 6. Divide, divided by the time, the period for one complete revolution. That's 24 times 60 times 60. If you bring in our calculator to solve that, we have 2 pi times 16 exponent 6 divided by 24 times 60 times 60. That is 1163.552835. And if we put that in standard notation, that would be 1.16 exponent 3 meters per second. So that is the speed of this artificial satellite. This question is asking us to state two differences between mass and weight. Now, to understand this, mass is the amount of matter in a body and it's a scalar quantity that is measured in kilograms. That's what we get when we stand upon um, a, a weight measure, okay? Whereas the weight is actually a force. It's the force of gravity on a body. It's a vector quantity. That is what you break a plate if you actually fall on a plate. So if you are to summarize this, it is just as shown on the board. Um, the mass is having a constant value. It doesn't vary from place to place. But the weight, due to the shape of the heart, the altitude, it varies from place to place. It's measured in newtons because its force is a vector quantity. And the mass is only a scalar quantity. It's measured in kilograms. These are some of the differences between mass and weight of a body. All right? OK. In this question, we are told that two forces, F and 250 newtons, act on a uniform rigid body of weight 50 newtons and we are to find the clockwise moment about the pivot and the value of F. Now, in the first question, we are asked the clockwise moment and that is the direction has been shown. It's the direction of the wall clock moving from our left to our right and navigating around um, just in a clockwise direction. So, the, the pivot is being shown in red. Now, if you look at the 50 newton force, that is a counterclockwise movement. It's going to be a counterclockwise moment. And then the force F is also going to be a counterclockwise moment. So the clockwise moment is the moment of the force that is 250 newton. So that's what we are first asked to get. That's the clockwise moment. So the clockwise moment about the pivot in the first question, the clockwise moment is... Clockwise moment about the pivot is the product of the force multiplied by the perpendicular distance to the point at which we are considering the moment. And in this particular case, is the distance, the perpendicular distance to the pivot as given in the diagram. So that means our work is we are multiplying the 250 newton multiplied by 0 0.75 meters. So that clockwise moment about the pivot is giving us the force that's 250 newtons multiplied by the perpendicular distance that's 0 0.75 meters. So if we bring in our calculator to evaluate that, we have 250 times 0 0.75. So that's 187.5 newton meters. So the clockwise moment about the pivot is 
187.5 newton meters. Okay. In this second question, we're asked to find the value of the force F. Okay. In this particular case, that means for us to solve this, we can consider all the moments about the pivot. So we are looking for the value of the force F that will keep this body in equilibrium. Okay. So we can just evaluate the distance. Now, in the question, we are told that the body is uniform. That means the weight of that body will act at the center. So 50 newtons at the center. Already we are given that the length of the body is 3 meters. Then the center of that will be 1.5 meters. So to the left of the 50 newton meters, this will be 1.5 meters. And already we have 0 0.75 meters to the right. So the remaining one will also be 0 0.75 meters. The addition of the 3 will give 3 meters as appropriate. So now, if you want to take moments, about this particular body, we already know that the 250 newtons will be work will be going through a clockwise moment. The 50 newton force will be going through a counterclockwise moment, and the F that we are looking for will also be going through a counterclockwise moment. Okay, so for this particular um, rigid body to be kept in equilibrium, the sum of the counterclockwise moment and the sum of the clockwise moment must be equal. So, if we are to take our counterclockwise moment, first we have force, the force F multiplied by the perpendicular distance, and that distance to the pivot will now be 1.5 plus 0 0.75 meters, okay? And then multiply by the other force, 50 newtons, multiply by its distance to the pivot, the point where we are taking the moment. That will be 50 times 0 0.75 is going to be the sum of the clockwise moment. That's 250 times 0 0.75, okay? We, we got this by taking moment about the pivot. So if we are to just open up our bracket and try and solve this, 1.5 plus 0 0.75, that will be 2.25 multiplied by F, okay, plus 50 times 0 0.75. Okay, if we, we are going to move that to the right hand side. So we have 250 times 0 0.75, okay. We got that initially to be 187.5, 187.5 minus 50 times 0 0.75. When they move to the right hand side, 50 times 0 0.75. As that 0 0.5. Okay. So if we are to evaluate that, 187.5 minus that 0 0.5, that will be 150. So we are going to see that our force that we are looking for. Is 150 divided by 2.25. So using our calculator to solve that, 150 divided by 2.25, that's 66.67 newtons. Okay? So that's the value of the force F. The diagram above illustrates the positions P, Q, and R of the object moving clockwise. Okay, the object is moving clockwise in a circular path. So we can say this is the direction of movement. That's clockwise. Okay. So we are asked to copy the diagram and draw straight lines with arrows to indicate the net force at P, acceleration at P, velocity V at R. So let's do that. I'm, I'm copying this. And I can just paste. Okay. So now the net force F at the point P will try and locate that. Now, for this particular um, diagram that we are giving, the net force F at P, okay, the force will be a centripetal force and it's going to be directed towards the center of the circular path. So the centripetal force F will be directed from P to the center of the circular part, which is T. So this is our F shown in red, okay? Then in the second case, we are asked to draw a straight line with arrows to indicate the acceleration at P. The acceleration will also be directed towards the center, just like the force. So the acceleration at P is also towards the center of the radial part. So there it is. 
shown in blue. That's acceleration A. All right. Then we're also asked to find the velocity V at R. Now, unlike the centripetal force and the acceleration, the velocity will be directed tangential to the radius of this circular part. Okay. So if the acceleration is acting towards the center, the velocity will be acting at an angle 90 degrees to the acceleration. So now we're asked that we should take that at point R. It's going to be tangential to the center of the circular part and it's going to be directed in the clockwise direction. So this is going to be our V, okay, V at an angle of 90 to the center of the circle. And that's the solution to our problem. In this question, we are told that a man weighs 100 newtons on the surface of the moon. If the acceleration due to gravity on the moon is one-sixth the value on the surface of the heart, we are to find the mass of the man on heart. Now, we need to be quite careful with this type of question. Even though we are giving the weight of the man on the surface of the moon, we need to remember that actually the mass of an object, the mass of a body does not change. The mass is not affected by acceleration due to gravity. The mass is a constant. It does not vary from place to place. I'm laying emphasis on this so that we don't make the mistake of just trying to calculate the weight of the man and just the weight of the man. No, we are asked to find the mass of the man on Earth. So the mass of the man on Earth and the mass of the man on the moon is going to be the same. It's only the weight of the man that can change. So if you have the moon as shown in the diagram and we have the man, okay, standing on the moon, maybe he's an astronaut, and then the same man on the heart, okay? Now, we are told that on the surface of the moon, the weight of the man, on the surface of the moon, the weight of this man, let's call that W, is 100 newtons, okay? Then, the acceleration due to gravity on the moon is one sixth the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the earth. So gm is 1 over 6 g. Now for the earth, we have been giving ge to be 10 meters per second square. All right? The acceleration due to gravity on the moon is 1 6 that of the earth. And the that of the earth, we have been giving us 10 meters per second square. So the acceleration due to gravity on the moon is 10 over 6 meters per second square. All right? So now, now since we are asked to find the mass of the man, okay, and I was making emphasis on it that whether on the heart or on the moon, the mass of the man is going to be the same. Now, from forces, mass times acceleration, the mass will be force over acceleration. But here in this case, we're talking about the weight and the acceleration due to gravity. So our M will be W divided by G on the moon. And that will be 100 divided by 10 over 6. And if we appropriately operate that, that will be 100 times 6 over 10. And that will be 60 kilogram. I don't need to bother myself with what is the mass of the man on earth or the mass of the, of the man on the moon. The mass is going to be constant whether the man is on the moon or he is on the heart. It's only the weight that differs. That is um, as a function of the acceleration due to gravity per location. So the mass of the man is 60 kilogram. In this question, we're asked to define the specific latent heat of vaporization. When we're talking about the specific latent heat of vaporization, we're talking about a change of state from liquid to gas, okay? And it is defined as the amount of heat needed to change one kilogram per unit mass of a substance from its liquid state at its boiling point and at constant temperature to vapor. So, as shown in the diagram, let's say we have um, a particular substance, okay? In his liquid state, as shown, and then these are substance in his liquid state, and is one kilogram per unit mass. Okay, so we are applying some heat. We're applying some heat to this, to this particular substance, and then at a particular, at its constant boiling point, at constant temperature, and at the boiling point of the liquid. The liquid is being transitioned, is undergoing a change of state from that liquid state to gaseous state. This is 
the amount of heat that is needed to carry out this process is defined as the specific latent heat of vaporization just as shown on the board. It is the quantity of heat needed to change 1 kg per unit mass of a substance from a liquid state at its boiling point and at constant temperature to vapor. This question is asking us why is the freezing compartment containing the evaporator normally located at the top of a fridge? Now, looking at the diagram of a fridge, as requested in the question, the upper part here, that's the freezing compartment, that's where the evaporator is located. And normally, let's look at our transfer of heat in this particular scenario. Normally, since that is the freezing compartment, that's going to generate cold air, okay? Now, cold air is denser than warm air. So, by reason of its density, it's going to migrate downwards. So, the cold, dense air, they are going to actually migrate downwards. They will be, because they are denser than the warm air that will be in the surrounding, it's going to navigate downwards, okay? Now, conversely, at the base of the fridge, we are going to have less dense here, okay? It's not as cold as the top, so it is less dense. Now, that we normally want to migrate upwards. So, the warm, less dense here in the fridge, at the base of the fridge, that we want to migrate upwards. And now, as a reason of this migration of, okay, the denser here at the top, at the evaporator, and the less dense one, convection is going to actually occur. So the colder air will descend down, the warmer air will rise up, and with that, there will be convection taking place so that everything that we are putting in the fridge will get to share um, some of the coolness of the refrigerator. So that is the explanation for this question. Yeah, we have to use the kinetic theory of matter to explain how addition of it to a substance causes an increase in temperature. Now, for us to actually explain this, way, we need to understand what is going on when heat is added to a particular substance. So, what we are going to do is we are going to consider um, this scenario in which we have um, a substance that is observable, okay? And for that particular substance, there is a temperature at which we are observing everything that is taking place initially. So, now, um, for the particular substance, the molecules and normally undergoing some movement, okay? But now, in this particular case, we ask that addition of it is being introduced to this system. Now, if it is being introduced to the system, what we are going to have is actually well explainable using the kinetic theory of matter. And that's what I'm going to attempt to do here. So if we have the scenario like this, normally what the heat energy that is introduced will do is that it's going to increase the internal energy within the system. And now, when the internal energy is increased, the average kinetic energy of the molecules increases so that they move about. The increase in average kinetic energy that will actually result in increase in temperature. Okay? So, once the heat is introduced to the system, the average kinetic energy of the molecules increased. And since the average kinetic energy of the molecules increased, they move more around. And as they are moving more around, it will be generated so that at, after the application of the heat, we have an increase in temperature. So that's how kinetic theory of matter can be used to explain the increase in temperature whenever we have addition of it. Now, this is going to be summarized below. Okay, So we have the summary that the heat energy is used to increase the internal energy of the substance. This increases the average kinetic energy of the molecules. And it's the increase in the average kinetic energy that results in increase in temperature. In this particular question, we are given that the diagram above illustrates two capillary tubes of uniform cross-sectional area, and then is containing a trap by mercury. Boyle's law is obeyed, and we have to calculate the atmospheric pressure. Now, how do we go about solving this question? Normally, we can have three cases in which we can talk about the pressure of the mercury and the atmospheric pressure. Now, the first case is when um, the tube is 
being placed as shown, the open end is at the top, the other case is lying horizontally, and then the third case, the open end is inverted downward. So if you have a um, trap there by Mercury, and Mercury is being shown in blue, okay, we can actually depict the effect of the pressure per stage for each of these three scenarios. So in this in the first case, now because of the orientation of the tube, normally we are going to have the atmospheric pressure and the mercury pressure. The mercury pressure will be pressing on the trap there downwards. Okay. Atmospheric pressure will also be pressing downwards on the mercury pressure. So the total pressure in this case will be the sum of the mercury pressure and the atmospheric pressure. But in the case in which the tube is lying horizontally, now the mercury pressure will not be included because that will just be acting downwards. It's not pressing on the air. So the total pressure in this case is only the atmospheric pressure. Okay? Now in the third case, we are seeing that the tube is inverted. So atmospheric pressure will still be acting upward, but the mercury pressure will be acting downward, just as if is responding to attrition due to gravity. So the total pressure will be the atmospheric pressure minus the pressure of the mercury because they're in opposite direction. So any of these two cases, we have three cases here. Any of the two can be used to actually solve this question with the application of Boyce's law. And what does Boyce's law state? Boyce's law is telling us that at constant temperature, the pressure is inversely proportional to the volume of an ideal gas, okay? So now we have pressure is inversely proportional to the volume at constant temperature. And as you can see, we're not talking about temperature in this particular setup. So that means we've introduced a constant into the equation. We can have a pressure is K over V so that K is equal to PV. Now, constant is equal to the multiplication of the pressure and the volume, meaning that the first pressure and the first volume, if we multiply them, is going to give us the second pressure and the second volume. And the graph is just as shown. is going to be this curve when we plot the graph of pressure against volume. So we are going to be using this to solve this particular question. P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2. So here for our question, in trying to go ahead to solve this question, we see that um, no, it's, it's quite noticeable that we are talking just about um, centimeters here, okay? So, since the tube in the first scenario is open at the top, the atmospheric pressure is going to be acting downwards, okay? But for the horizontal case, in which the tube is lying horizontally, we are saying that we are not going to be using any um, pressure for the mercury. It's only going to be the atmospheric pressure acting inwards at the open end of the tube. Now, the, the length of the mercury and the length of the dry air is actually um, analogous to the pressure that we are talking about. So we have a scenario one and a scenario two. And by Boyce's law, as we looked at initially, we know that P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. So what is left for us to note is that now our pressure is actually analogous to the length that we have been given, and likewise our volume also, all right? The pressure, we are using the pressure of the mercury and the pressure of the atmosphere, the volume we are using, the length of the dry air in the tube. So now in the first case, what's going to be our P1? P1 is going to be the sum of the atmospheric pressure and the mercury pressure. So that will be PA plus 15 centimeter. 15 centimeter is what is analogous to the mercury pressure, okay? And then, in the second case, we're only looking for the atmospheric pressure because the pressure of the mercury is not acting on the dry air. So, using Boyce's law, we can go ahead to try and solve this particular question. So, in the first case, we have the P1 is PA plus 15. Then the V1, V1 will be 20 for the first case and 24 for the second case. So, we have PA plus 15 multiplied by 20 is equal to PA multiplied by 24. So we can divide both sides by 20. So in the first case, the 20s we cut out. In the second case, we can say 4 goes, 4 in 20 is 5, 4 in 24 is 6, 
Okay. So if we move, okay, we want to just solve this. We cannot say that we have um, 6 over 5 PA. Okay. When the other PA on the initial left hand side moves to the right, that will be minus PA. Okay. That is equal to 15. So if we find out LCM, we have 5, we have 6 PA minus this over 1 minus 5 PA. So that will equal to 15. Okay? 15 over 1. So 6 PA minus 5 PA is PA. Then 5 will cross over to the other side so that we have our atmospheric pressure is 15 times 5. And that is um, 75 centimeter mercury. You know, we are working relative to mercury. So it's 75 centimeters mercury. In this question, we are told that red beans of mass 100 grams is capable of releasing 240 kilocalories of energy in a day. An adult requires 2,200 kilocalories to perform optimally. We have to calculate the mass of beans required to sustain 500 adults first. Okay, now this is looking more like um, a relational question. We are told that 240 kilocalories is obtained from 100 grams of beans. 100 grams is the same as 0 0.1 kilogram. Okay, so we have from 0 0.1 kilogram of beans. Okay. So now, an adult is going to need 2,200 kilocalories to perform optimally. So, an adult is going to be needing, just one adult in this case, note that, an adult is going to be needing how many kilograms of beans? We can calculate that. That 2,200 kilograms can be gotten from S kilogram of beans. So, in just relating these two statements proportionally, we can have 240 is equivalent to 0 0.1 kilogram. 2,200 is equivalent to hex. So, if you cross multiply, you also find the value of beans that will be needed per adult, mind you. S is going to be 2,200 times 0 0.1 divided by 240. So, using our calculator to evaluate that, times 0 0.1 divided by 240, that's 0 0.9167, okay? So, we have 0 0.9167 kilogram of beans. will be needed for an adult, okay? This will be the the kilogram of beans needed per adult. But we ask for the mass of beans required to sustain 500 adults. All right. So, in that case, 500 adults will require 0 0.917 multiplied by 500. So, when I just say 500 adults will require 500 times 0 0.917 kilogram of beans. And if I had to bring in our calculator, so if you are to bring in our calculator, that will be our answer multiplied by 500. And that will be 458.33 kilogram of beans. So the mass of beans required to sustain 500 adults will be 458.3 kilogram of beans. All right. Now, furthermore, we have to find the mass of fuel that will be required if a nuclear reactor were to produce the same amount of energy as in our previous question. And we are told that 1 kilocalorie is 4,184 joules, and then C is 3 exponent 8 meter per second. Now, we have already established the fact that one adult needs 2,200 kilocalories of energy. Okay. But one kilocalorie of energy is the same as um, 4,184 joules. So to find the amount of energy that will be equivalent to what one adult needs, that will be 4,184 multiplied by 2,200. And that will be the energy that an adult needs to be sustained. Now, that's just for an adult. For 500 adults, are going to be needing 500 multiplied by this value. So we have 4,184 
times 2,200 times 500 joules of energy. That will be what will be required for 500 adults. That will be the amount of energy that 500 adults are going to need. Now, we should know that for a nuclear re reactor, the energy, the energy from the nuclear reactor E, the energy E from a nuclear reactor is given as M multiplied by C raised to the power 2. Okay? So now we are asked to find the mass M and we have been given the value of C. So you want to relate these two that the energy from the nuclear reactor and the energy needed by 500 men, we can say M C raised to the power 2 is equal to 4184 times 2200 times 500. Okay? And now we have been giving C to be 3 times 10 raised to the power 8 meters per second. So we can say our M is going to be 4184 times 2200 times 500 divided by 3 times 10 raised to the power 8 or raised to the power 2. So we can use our calculate to evaluate that. So we have. Four one eight four times two thousand two hundred times five hundred divided by three exponent eight raised to the power two. Okay, so that's five dot one one three seven exponent minus eight. So we have five dot one one exponent minus eight kilogram of fuel. So that's the solution to that question. We are asked to list the three secondary colors of light in this question. Now, there is a color wheel that is generally used um, to identify the secondary, the primary colors of light, and it is as shown on the board. So the primary colors are red, blue, and green, and the secondary colors are the um, mixture of all these three. So red and blue will give magenta, Red and green will give yellow, and blue and green will give cyan. So the primary colors are noted to be red, blue, and green, and secondary colors are magenta, yellow, and cyan. We have this diagram here. We're told that the diagram illustrates a defect of the human eye. We have to state the type of defect and the name of and the type of lens to be used in correcting that defect. Now Looking at this image, um, we are seeing that the image is being formed far behind the retina. So the defect is long sightedness. It's not being formed on the retina. It's being formed far, far behind the retina. And another name for that is hypermetropia. That is the defect that's being shown um, in the diagram. Now, to correct this type of defect, looking at the rays of light coming from the object, we are seeing that they are going far beyond where they're supposed to go. So what we need is a converging lens to convert them on the retina where they are ideally supposed to be. So if we bring in a converging lens. Normally, a converging lens is going to converge rays of light that are passing through it. So um, rather than the original location of the rays of light, now the converging lens will converge those rays to the pupil. Okay. And then the pupil can just have um, lesser work to do to converge the rays on the retina as shown. And so once a converging lens is brought in, the defect will be corrected. Here in this question, an object is placed between two mirrors inclined at right angles to each other. And we have to find the number of images formed and then we have to copy the diagram and locate and label the position of the images formed by the mirrors. Now, there's a formula for to get the number of images for mirrors inclined at an angle to one another. And that formula is given as um, the number of images n. So the n is 360 divided by theta minus 1 where theta is the angle of inclination of the two mirrors to one another. In this particular question, we are told that they are inclined at right angles to one another. Right angles, okay? So, 
we are going to have 360 over 90, which is a right angle, minus 1. That will give us 4 minus 1. So the number of images that will be formed is 3. So we have 3 images are going to be formed. Good. Now, in this second question, we are told to copy the diagram. So I'm going to just copy that out and paste. So on the copy diagram, we have to locate and label all the positions of the images formed by the mirrors. Now for mirror one, the object distance and the image distance are going to be the same. So I'm showing that in blue, okay? It's directly opposite, there's no enlargement, it's just like that. For mirror two, the same distance, the same offset to the mirror is going to be on the other side of the mirror. So this is image two from mirror two, okay? So now what we're going to have is that the mirrors will be extended and they're also going to reflect the image of one another. So here, yeah, um, mirror one is also going to reflect the image from mirror two at this location, okay? And then mirror two is also going to reflect the image of mirror one. So if mirror two is also extended up to that point, It also reflects the image of image one at the same location in which the zone previous image is located. So if you are to actually label them, we have this as image one, the red as image two. But since both are supposed to actually reflect, we have this is um, image three and also image four. Okay, image three and image four are being located at the same position. Since they are both located at the same position, we are just going to see them as one. So we don't need to put them as two images. We can just say this is um, image three. We can append it as image three. So if you look at this, this is consistent with the formula that we just used to obtain um, the number of images that will be formed. And that is um, 360 divided by 90 minus one. So that one is actually the image that we are subtracting from this case, and that's the solution to our problem. Okay, so in this question, we are told that a mirror of focal length 60 centimeters is used to produce a virtual image. So focal length is 60 centimeters. We have a fragile image that is three times larger than the object. Now, we need to note this value that we are saying that is a virtual image. That's going to carry an implication that will reflect whenever we are working and trying to solve our question. So we have our focal length f is 60 centimeters. We have the magnification, magnification of the virtual image. We have m, magnification m is three. And normally the magnification is the image size over the object size. So that is v over u. The ratio of their proportion to one another is three. So we have three is equal to V over U. And we can say V is three U if you cross multiply. So if you want to use the lens formula to try and solve this particular question, the lens formula is stating that um, one over half is one over U plus one over V. But in this particular question, we have been told that we are talking about a virtual image. Now, not noticing that we ensure that we are going to miss this question. But, so what does it imply when we are saying the image is virtual? That means that the image is located at the same position as the object. So that image is negative because normally we are located at the other side. So our V is going to be negative. So that our formula will now be one over F is equal to one over U minus one over V, okay? But V is equal to three U. So if we are to use that value, we have one over f, f is 60, one over 60 is equal to one over u minus one over three u, instead of v, now we are saying three u. We can find the LCM and that will give us one, okay, we have three minus one over three u, okay, so we have that as two over three u. So we have one over 60 is equal to two over three u. We can cross multiply such that three u will be two times 60 is, 120, you can divide by 3, okay? So that if we solve this, our u, the object distance, is going to be 2 times 20, which is 40. So 40 centimeters is the value of 
the object distance, but nobody asks us to find the object distance. We are trying to find, we are asked to find the image distance from the mirror. So the image distance is V, all right? So image distance is V, and V I've been given as 3U, so that will be 3 times 40, and that's going to be 120 centimeters. That's the solution to our problem. What we needed to note is that the image is virtual, so V is going to be negative, and with that, our question will be done and dusted. We are to state Lenz law in this particular question. And Lenz law states that in this current or EMF flows in such a way as to oppose the change in magnetic flux or any motion producing it. So, as shown in the diagram, if the motion causing the EMF is in a particular direction, the flux will flow in the other direction. And this is um, the Lenz law that is used in electromagnetic induction and quite a whole lot of um, other applications. Okay, so that's Lenz law. Okay, yeah, we're asked to stay to applications of magnets. Magnet finds a lot of application in so many of our day-to-day -day activities. So some of them are being shown here. The magnet is being used in the magnetic compass for navigation. It's facilitating circuitry in headphones, and is is used to generate traditional motion in electric motors. Is using MRI to scan the human body, can be used to separate mistrust, and these are just some few ways in which we make use of magnets um, in so many various fields. This question, we are told that the diagram illustrates a step down transformer uh, to state the reason for using two coils, state the reason for using iron core and an alternating supply. Now, um, the points are listed below. Two coils were used to vary the input and the output voltage or current. An ion con is used for effective magnetic flux linkage. Ion can actually generate that a lot. Then the AC supply is used because if you use DC, that's going to provide a constant current, which will only be used in the primary winding and not the secondary winding because the rate of change of magnetic flux in that case will be zero. So AC voltage is used and not DC. All right. So here yeah, we're asked to find the secondary current of the transformer. Now, looking at the diagram, the primary coil is to the left, the secondary to the right. And now we're asked to find, we're not giving the number of tons in the secondary coil, we're giving the number of tons in the primary. By giving the voltage in the secondary, we're asked to find this current. But for the primary, we have the current and the voltage. Now, um, generally, for the transformer, the product of the current and the voltage in the primary coil is equal to the product of the current and the voltage in the secondary coil. So now the primary current is given as 5 amperes, okay? And the primary voltage is given as 220 volts. We can equate that to the secondary current that we are looking for multiplied by the secondary voltage, which is 110. So looking at this, our secondary current will be 5 times 220 divided by 110. And 110 can cut such that our secondary current is 10 amperes. All right. In this question, we are told that the circuit is connected as shown and the resistance of the voltmeter, now of the voltmeter, is 200 ohms. So locating the voltmeter, R is 200 ohms. Okay. So we have to calculate the voltmeter reading, the reading on the voltmeter. Now we need to actually analyze this circuit. Ideally, the same current will flow in series. So the current across the circuit, the current I, we can evaluate. But first, before we can evaluate the current, we need to find the total resistance of the circuit. So if you have that, we can use the Ohm's law. V is equal to I R total. R total now is the total resistance. So that I will now be voltage divided by the total resistance. So our first assignment is to find what is the value of the total resistance. We can call the 500 ohm R1 and the 400 ohms R2. But now R1 and the resistance of the voltmeter are in parallel. So we have R parallel, which we need to evaluate. And for us to find that it is 1 over R parallel is 1 over R the resistance of the voltmeter plus 1 over R1 
the 500 ohm resistance. So, if we are to solve this, we can say we are going to have 1 over RP is equal to 1 over 200 plus 1 over 500. So, for this, we can easily find the LCM as 1000. Then, 200 and 1000 is 5. 5 times 1 is 5 plus 500 and 1000 is 2. 2000 is 2. So, um, 1 over RP is 7 over 1000. So, that our RP is 1000 over 7. If we find the inverse of both sides. Okay. But now, that is not the total resistance. That is not the total of the value of resistance. The total resistance will now be the resistance in parallel plus the resistance R2 in series. So we have 1000 over 7 plus 400 over 1. And if we find that LCM, that's 7 and 1000 plus 1 is 7 is 7, 7 times 4 is 2800. So that the total resistance is 3800 over 7. So now, since we know the total resistance, we can find the value of the current from. I is equal to V over RT and V is 6 volts. Okay. So we have 6 over 1 divided by the R total is 3800 over 7. So evaluating that, we have 6 multiplied by 7 divided by 3800. So our calculator can help us to evaluate that. We will have this to be. Six times seven divided by three thousand eight hundred. With that, let's put that in scientific notation. Okay. Now eleven dot zero five exponent minus three. Minus three amperes. So that's the value of the current flowing in the circuit. Okay, but now we are asked to find the voltmeter reading. What the voltmeter is going to read is going to be affected by the 500 ohm resistance and the internal resistance of the voltmeter itself. Okay, so within these two nodes shown in red, the resistance there is the hard parallel. So the voltmeter reading. Is going to be the current multiplied by the resistance in parallel. So that will be both meter reading will be I multiplied by the R parallel. Okay. So that is going to be 11.05 exponent minus 3 multiplied by R parallel is 1000 over 7. So if we bring in our calculator, we'll just our initial answer. Multiply by 1000 divided by 7. So that is 1.578 or 1.58 volts. So that's 1.58 volts. And that is the solution to our problem. In this question, we're asked to state two sources of background radiation. Now, background radiation is a measure of the level of M. Ionizing radiation that is present in an environment at a particular location, which is not due to deliberate introduction of radiation sources. So, normally there are radiation that are coming in, but is not deliberate. So, this is what is referred to as um, background radiation. And sometimes they can be gotten from um, medical X rays, sometimes from cosmic rays, the one happening from outer space, sometimes from radioactive substance in the head cross sometimes from nuclear power stations and such like. So, these are not deliberate release of um, radiation into the atmosphere. It's just regarded as background radiation. So, some of the sources are mentioned already. We have X-rays, sometimes from cosmic rays, sometimes from the heart crust, and um, they are not deliberate, okay? Now, the reason why the country of background radiation is not concerned at a particular place is that normally, um, Reductive decay is a random and continuous process. It's always changing dynamically. And since it's always changing, that means that it cannot be constant at a particular place. So with that, our question here had been handled. Okay, in this question, we have to name two materials that cannot be dated using carbon dating. Now, um, 
normally when carbon dating is being used, it is used on um, objects that are containing organic material and they're using the properties of radioactive material um, carbon 14. So any material that does not contain carbon 14 cannot be carbon dated. So brick, rock, and metals are examples of such. And with this, you cannot actually use carbon dating to date them. Now, the type of nuclear reaction that can be used to detect leakage in an underground pipe is the gamma radiation. Why? Because gamma radiation can be detected through earth and metals. Okay, so if you are looking at an underground pipe and there is a leakage that is actually there on the underground pipe, what is done ideally to locate the location of the leakage is that um, a radioactive substance that can give gamma radiation like say sodium 24 will be introduced into the underground pipe okay so a gigamolar tube will be used to measure the amount of radiation that is detectable um, over the span of area that the pipe is going through and normally a constant rate of radiation will be detected but at the point at which there was a leakage the radiation will be quite high, so um, an observer can easily read this over and say, okay, this is a point where the leakage is happening because I'm getting a high reading of um, radiation that is coming from gamma rays embedded in sodium-24. So it is gamma radiation that is used to detect leakage in underground pipe. In this question, we are told that two metal surfaces, X and Y, of work functions, 2.9 and 4.8 to electron volts, are illuminated by light of wavelength 330 nanometers. So we want to get the surface that will emit photoelectrons and calculate the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons. Now, ideally, if you have a metal with electrons, okay, and then for the metal with these electrons, we have photons of light energy, photons of light energy of some particular um, frequency that are incident on them. Photoelectric emission will only take place when some conditions are being met, okay? So without those conditions being met, there's no means through which um, we can have photoelectric emission taking place. Now, for this particular scenario, each photon will actually carry a quantum energy that is giving us E, and E is defined as H multiplied by F. H is a Planck constant. F is the frequency of the photon. And now, the frequency is also the speed of light divided by the wavelength. All right? Now, this is acting on a metal with work function, the metal with work function file. So, now, for electrons to be emitted from the metal, the quantum energy of the photon must of a necessity be greater than the work function of the metal. So if that is the case, then the electron that will be emitted will carry a kinetic energy that is going to actually be the difference between the quantum energy of the photon minus the work function of the metal. So if an electron will be emitted, the photon energy will be greater than the work function and the kinetic energy of the electron that is released will be that quantum energy minus the work function. So using this principle, we can now go ahead to try and solve this question to actually get um, which of the surfaces, either surface X or surface Y, that will release an um, electron in this particular question that we're giving. We just need to know that for electron emission to occur, the photon energy must be greater than the work function. For the question one, we have been given that the wavelength is 330 nanometers. But for us to calculate the photon energy E, we know that E is equal to the Planck constant multiplied by the frequency. But now we are not giving frequency, we are giving the wavelength, and frequency is the speed of light divided by wavelength. So we have our H, Planck constant, we have the speed of light C, and we have our lambda. Lambda was given as 330 nanometers. Now, what is the meaning of nanometers? Nanometers means 10 raised to power minus nine. So if you are to put in all this value, H is 6.6 dot six exponent minus 34, C is 3 exponent 8, and then the lambda is 330 nanometers. And like I said, nanometers means times 10 raised to the power minus 9. 
So we can use our calculator to solve that. 6.6 exponent minus 34 multiplied by 3 exponent 8 divided by 330 exponent minus 19. So this is 6 exponent minus 9. So the photon energy that is coming on the metal surface is 6 exponent minus 19 joules. Now, interestingly, we are given the work function of the metal in electron volts. So we know that we have been given that one electron volt is 1.6 exponent minus 19 joules. So for us to get the electron volt that will be equivalent to 6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19 joules, we can say x electron volt is 6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19 joules. We can cross multiply this so that we can have our x. It will now be 6 exponent minus 19 times 1 divided by 1.6 exponent minus 19. 6 divided by 1.6 and that is 3.75 electron volt. So it's 3.75 electron volt that is the photon energy coming on the surface of the metal. And the two metals we have, one is 2.9 electron volts, the other is 4.8 electron volts. So 3.75 is greater than the 2.9 electron volts. So it is on the metal X in which the photon energy is greater than the work function of the metal that will emit electrons. So it is surface X that will emit um, electrons and not surface Y because the photon energy is not up to the work function of the surface wire. All right. And last question, we are asked to calculate the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons. Now, already, we have been saying that um, for the case of photoelectric emission, the photon energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the work function, so that the kinetic energy will be the photon energy minus the work function. So we just calculated the um, photon energy to be 3.75 electron volts. We have been given the work function to be 2.9 electron volts. So if we are to subtract that, our kinetic energy will be 0 0.85 electron volts. But one electron volt is equal to 1.6 exponent minus 19 joules. So one electron volt is 1.6 exponent minus 19 joules. So 0 0.85 electron volt will be equal to 0 0.85 multiplied by 1.6 exponent minus 19 joules. So if we plug in that value in the calculator, this will be 0 0.85 times 1.6 exponent minus 19. And that's 1.36 exponent minus 19 joules. So that's the, that's the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons. And that is the solution to our problem. So that's all we are going to be having in our lecture today. We hope that this will be of benefit, of use to somebody out there. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We have a lot of resources that you can use to enhance your academic excellence. And that's our desire that you go out and be the best. And as you do all this, we know that all will work out together for good. Until next time, God bless you.